Welcome to Microdosing Table Talks, the world's first podcast dedicated exclusively to learning more about, you guessed it, microdosing. For those new to the community, microdosing is the practice of consuming a psychedelic substance in tiny subhallucinogenic doses with the purpose of enhancing one's quality of life. While this practice has its roots in ancient and indigenous traditions, there's still a lot to learn and a great deal of mystery to uncover. Here at Microdosing Institute, our mission is to merge and honor this ancient wisdom with the growing body of scientific knowledge. In the podcast, we'll introduce you to experts in the psychedelic space to bring you a better understanding of how microdosing can truly serve us, both as individuals and humanity at large. Before we begin, we'd like to extend a thank you to our friends at microdose.nl for sponsoring this episode. Microdose.nl is Europe's number one shop for all of your microdosing needs. For our community members based in the European Union, check out microdose.nl before your next microdosing cycle. Now, let's go ahead with today's episode. Today, Hein and myself, Jacobin, are sitting down with a wonderful guest who is making important contributions to microdosing research. Dutch psychedelics researcher Eline Haien. Eline is a PhD candidate at the Department of Neuropsychology and Psychopharmacology at Maastricht University. This is where she obtained her research master degree in cognitive and clinical neuroscience with a specialization in neuropsychology. Right now, she investigates the emotional, cognitive and possible therapeutic effects of low doses of psychedelics in healthy and patient populations. With her work, she also aims to get deeper understanding of how psychedelics impact our biological mechanisms, our sleep and well-being. Wow, <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Eline. Um, yeah, yeah. To, uh, to kick off with the first question, uh, what, what situation or who brought you on this path of uh, researching the effect of psychedelics on human beings and microdosing in general? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you here in person. Um, what started off my path? Um, I was always interested in human behavior, so I studied psychology. And then later I, I found the connection with the brain very interesting. And then following that path um, led to, to um, discovering that the influence of drugs on the brain really interests me. So I, I um, picked a few electives during my studies, uh, one of which was uh, psychopharmacology, so the effects of drugs on the brain. And during one um, of those classes, we focused on psychedelics, and I didn't know much about psychedelics or anything at all. And um, um, we learned a few, like we, we were offered the literature of um, Imperial at that time, of how um, psychedelics could be used to treat depression. I was like, well, how? <laughs> this is an illegal drug and why and how could that work? And that just sparked my interest. And then I started, um, yeah, delving more into this topic. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, and, and what's your biggest fascination? Is that the, uh, the psychedelics uh, and depression? Or? Um, no, that developed more. So. But that just sparked my interest at how can these these illegal bad drugs at the time that was my impression be used like to treat people um but then more I was more focused or interested in more the well being aspect of it um and understanding like what happens in the brain so and um so I studied neuros neuropsychology and there's um um a big focus on the clinical aspect, but I tend to be more interested in the research aspect of it. So it's great that it can help people, but I'm more focused like why and how, yeah. <laughs> how does it work? Yeah. Okay. And so for, for everyone who's listening now, like our entire microdosing community um, is very interested in the advancements in research and especially for, um, for microdosing and um, in general, Scientists say there is not much research out there and the quality of the research that has been done is not too good. Um, so can you maybe use this as a starting point to give us a bit of an overview of what has been discovered um, on these low doses of psychedelics? Like where do we stand now uh, scientifically? Um, I think 
um, the maybe the difference between the type of studies should be maybe ex explained a little bit. So you have naturalistic studies where you just observe behavior that's going on, which is a quite easy way of conducting a study because you will, for example, hand out surveys and collect self-report measures of um, people who are already microdosing. That's one um, type of study. And um, these studies happened already quite a lot and um, there's a lot of information based um, on these type of studies. And then we have the controlled experimental studies where experimenters in a lab manipulate a certain condition um, and this is what happens in placebo control studies and of those there's like far less like even a few um, and and results of those studies tend to disagree or like there's not one mm -hmm. consensus and and yeah that's interesting because people report big benefits and studies fail to really find those um, benefits or like some do, some don't. So there's a yeah discrepancy um, in those. And um, what is also important um, to know with these placebo-controlled ones is that many studies just focus on one acute dose instead of uh, following people for mul like multiple doses. And that is of course the point of microdosing. It's not just one dose. Mm -hmm. um, so that's imp important to realize. So I think both type of studies have their flaws um, and both have their benefits. But still, um, I think in the future, we will come up with a more fitted study design or approach or maybe combine them to really find what's going on in the microdosing. Mm. Yeah. And I'm actually curious, I'm not sure if, if, if you know the answer to this, but is it common, does it happen in other uh, fields of research or other, um, when it comes to medications, for instance, is it also common that there are differences reported between what people actually experience and what is proven in the lab? Or is this really something that we now see from microdosing as like a unique phenomenon? Um, I'm not sure. But I think uh, the big, like the large amount of survey studies um, that is now available in microdosing and the few um, placebo controlled ones is because these drugs are illegal and it's very difficult to conduct a placebo controlled study. And I think for other medications that are approved and they are there, um, I think less survey studies are even needed. So maybe that discrepancy is not even that obvious because this this is more in balance or like uh, there's more evidence from placebo controlled so i think with the psychedelics there's just this weird situation where there's so much evidence from self-reported um, benefits and less placebo controlled but I'm, uh, yeah i'm not sure with what that is the case with with uh, other medications no 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 and of course it is then probably also the nature of psychedelics that they have these very um, noticeable and profound effects and you know now there are also researchers um, that we met at a conference recently just talking about how can we make good placebos for studies with high dose psychedelics because the effects are so remarkable that of course uh, that's a challenge um, and when it comes to microdosing again then the, the, the effects are so subtle that it is just how do we measure that right so um, i think this is the, the biggest challenge at the moment uh, that it always has been a topic since the 50s that they knew that certain setting influenced the whole the whole experience and uh, yeah so that yeah like kim kuiper said uh, it, it, it's also uh, if you have the measurements or the, the the tools to measure it actually accurately and how do you in a clinical setting measure it for over a longer period of time that can be a really good ch uh, yeah challenge mm -hmm. yeah mm. um so i think 
now it's a good time to maybe hear a bit more about your work specifically. So, um, yeah, can you walk us through uh, what you guys have been studying when it comes to microdosing in the past few years uh, with uh, the team? Uh, we know some of the others as well, Kim Kuipers and uh, Nadia Hutton and uh, so many others. I think it's growing. <laughs> so Natasha. You, Natasha, yeah, yeah. So can you just um, yeah walk us through what you've been studying and what you've been discovering thus far? Um, yeah, I think the main microdosing person in our department um, is Nadia um, and of course Kim, but as a supervisor and, and Jan Ramakers as well. Um, but yeah, Nadia conducted a few uh, placebo-controlled um, studies with um, LSD, low doses of LSD. And um, one of the studies was a dose-finding study where they um, provided multiple doses like um, zero micrograms or placebo, five, ten and fifty. 5, 10, and 20 micrograms. And um, and afterwards, they did a repeated dosing study with 15 micrograms of LSD. But as far as I know, that has not been published yet. I'm not sure. What I'm <laughs> anyway, and um, um, that was it actually for microdosing. Um, then my um, PhD uh, project was on... Um, is on uh, the effects of low dose LSD in ADHD. Um, so we we set up a study and it has been approved by the METC, so the ethical committee uh, of our university. And um, but that has not started yet. So in the meantime, we we set up a few other studies and uh, they have also been approved. Uh, one of it, which is a naturalistic study, which I explained before. So we observe the behavior that's going on. Uh, also in ADHD patients or people without an ADHD diagnosis who uh, express that they um, um, experience severe complaints. Um, so like since the start of my PhD, I'm mainly focused on that uh, while setting up other um, controlled studies and getting them approved. Um, yeah, and, and the first um, publication of that project um, has been published uh, in October, so I'm very happy with that. And um, yeah, it was an interesting project. Um, so we we set, we advertised it also on, on your website, and um, a lot of people signed up at the start, like 250, I believe. And we assessed them at baseline, so we gave them a surveys um, assessing certain traits, well-being, um, and ADHD symptoms, of course, and um, then. Two and four weeks later, we gave them the same set of questionnaires to see how um, microdosing would influence these traits. Um, all participants had the intention to microdose on their own initiative, so we didn't provide any advice or anything related to microdosing, but they did it on their own. And um, we found uh, that ADHD symptoms were, were decreased um, after two weeks and were further decreased after four weeks and well-being was increased um, after two weeks and stayed at the same level after four weeks. So that was quite a positive finding. Uh, and it is in line with what people uh, report in anecdotes. Um, but the benefit of this study was that we used um, standardized measures um, to really quantify if, if there was a big improvement or not, or is it just like feeling that it, yeah. it was working for them? Okay, so not only that they say it, yeah, I feel better, I have better well-being, but you could also really measure it. Yeah, yeah and even like also compare it to other treatments, for example, because the ADHD symptom um, scale that we used is like a widely used measure. Mm -hmm. Also in, in um, methylphenidate or like stimulant research, for example, so we can actually see how much do they improve. Mm. So, so, so can you tell us what are some of the most common symptoms uh, that are measured also on this scale? Um, so ADHD is characterized by ma two main symptom domains. So that's inattention and hyperactivity and or impulsivity. Um, and then you have to think of just problems, or just keeping focused. And like maybe an interesting thing is we all have an idea of ADHD in children. Well, they cannot focus in class and are very... Uh, can't sit still, but in, in adults it's often um, less recognizable. And um, 
so you have to think of failing to meet deadlines or you cannot really focus at work or you're just fidget, fidgeting with everything these are like can be uh, examples of uh, ADHD in adults mm. yeah. mm. okay and um, you also had a group who used microdosing in combination with Ritalin or other um, uh, ADHD medication can you explain what the findings were there yeah, so we, we assessed that baseline if um, if they were using current medication, like conventional medication, or uh, if they stopped using it or, ne or never used it. And based on uh, if they were currently using it, we, we put them in a separate, um, well, not group, but we just labeled them as they are microdosing and using conventional treatment. And um, we saw that after two weeks of microdosing, they seemed to decrease less in symptoms. So you saw um, uh, a, a drop in their symptoms, but those using conventional medications seem to drop less. But after four weeks, the, there is no difference between these people. So what we think is that it just took a bit longer for them to respond to the, the positive effect, like experience positive effects. But yeah, it's, it's interesting and there's no further research on it. So this is spe just speculation, but it would be cool to test it in the lab um, to see if there, if if there is no um, big interference of these conventional treatments, or if it can just really replace uh, yeah. conventional treatment. And and how does how do, do the findings of your study compare to only conventional treatments? Um, they um, I compared it to a study with with methylphenidate, and they seem to um, respond equally as well. Um, so that is nice, but of course that was a controlled experiment. So they had a placebo also control that is just says more than yeah. maybe um, in our study, because we have people who just wanted to do it on their own initiative, which then also creates a positive expectation, right? You, you choose this treatment, so you are very positive about it. So you can, um, via this way, also influence your experience in a way. And of course, that is a big um, limitation of this type of uh, yeah. studies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think also the how people generally. Well, first of all, if they have prior experience with psychedelics or with microdosing, uh, and yeah, and how do they see this in general? Like, if they're very positive about it, the expectation might be there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, but I, I don't think it's specific to psychedelics. It's with any type of treatment or any type of exercise or any type of like self-treatment. If you if you think mindfulness is really going to help you, then it will already help you more because you think you will. And that's just a yeah. n nice thing about our mind and how it works, that it's just very powerful. Yeah. I guess. I think psychedelics in general uh, uh, has to be uh, approached and that that's your expectations influence the outcome and if you know that and you, you could better embrace it but also incorporate it into the whole study instead of just focusing on is it the placebo effect and uh, yeah i've talked about it with kim or also uh, yeah you you've in the dosing finding study you've measured differences so yeah it's more than just the placebo effect and of course there is a placebo effect in everything you do so also with psychedelics but um, yeah yeah actually this this brings me to this point of the, the dose finding study i remember that the most um, significant findings were with the let's say the higher spectrum of the microdoses so the the 20 micrograms of lsd which for instance in my case that would be much more than a microdose even um, but in our community what we see a lot is, um, and, and actually in the wider global microdosing community, is that the doses are kind of being uh, corrected downwards. So people are taking less and less and finding that if they really observe themselves, they already find benefits at really small doses. So, you know, the five micrograms of LSD or the uh, 0 0.1 of uh, uh, dried mushrooms um, yeah. yeah, a lot of people, even experienced microdosers who come to our programs, they sometimes say like, you know what, I, I sticked with the lower dose this time because I already felt supported and uh, I already felt like it was it was enough for me. Yeah. Yeah, this, is, this is something we're also very interested in how 
how do people decide on what dose they will be using during such a microdosing um, trajectory? So what what do these people then report? Is it just like they feel they have positive benefits without having any negative benefits? That's what I assume how they pick their dose, or is it something else? Really? Yeah. Well, in 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 our six week uh, coaching program, for instance, we we uh, we have a calibration week. So uh, mm -hmm. especially if people are already experienced in microdosing, they think, okay, I I need uh, one gram of fresh truffles or something. So so we um, motivate them to 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 take less to to find out if you're still noticing any effect and uh, because we advocate for less is more so so yeah that, and 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 once you have uh experienced uh, uh the microdose and you know the direct effects you can easily notice it in a, sli uh, a slightly uh the, yeah the less you take it you you still notice it so so that is i think also what interferes in if you if you do the dosing finding study with only one dose, then of course the the, the person who who takes twenty micrograms will definitely have uh, more effect or more experience. But it doesn't mean that it's a more pleasant experience or a more a meaningful experience. So um, so yeah, um, I don't know if you want to add something to it. Yeah, it it, it seems just that microdosing. Uh, um helps uh, everyone move away from this paradigm of y like you're taking a medication you're taking something and you need to wait and feel the effect and then you know it's working and that's kind of the old paradigm and now we're moving into something that it could be seen more as a supplement um it, it i have always been told this in in ayahuasca ceremonies you know in a, by by shamans like you might not notice too much during this ceremony um, but just know that the medicine is working on you anyway. Um, and if it is really that, uh, or if it's something else, I think we don't really know. We cannot really say for sure. But yeah, we see in our community also that people who try taking less and, uh, you know, half of their previous microdose, they still find all those benefits and they say, oh, actually, I feel more at ease this way. So I can just, you know, do all my day to day activities instead of feeling slightly nervous that I have to go to work or so for us, that's really a sign like, yeah, then maybe you weren't quite microdosing. You were just on the, you know, uh, edge of your microdose. So, um, yeah, we're all learning about this. And um, uh, I, I really hope actually for science to... Uh, to uh, to come up with the, 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 the what is this working mechanism behind it like what is this sort of threshold that we that apparently is quite low uh, yeah. to be effective yeah for, for every person it's different but I, I would I, um, when I advise people to how to find a sweet spot it's it's like if you take a little bit too much it also interferes in your whole experience because because you're focusing on the direct effect too much and then uh, it can uh, yeah it's like a, a dog chasing its own tail constantly you're constantly uh, yeah focusing on that direct effect and, and and if you take a little bit less then you almost forget you took it, but then you are entering that that natural flow of uh, of uh, the present moment, um, and so that is one of the yeah the 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 the, the things that you have to look for uh, when you find your sweet spot. And of course, the sweet spot is not a fixed thing because set and setting also influences it. If you have a meeting with a lot of people or a presentation, it could be that your sweet spot is a little bit less than when you will go and walk in nature with your dog or with your friend or partner so um so yeah that that comes maybe to the question um you mentioned it set and setting and uh, there was a paper uh, released last week or recently um can you explain why you find it important the set and setting yeah um more because set and setting is such a big important thing and a big focus in in large dose studies uh, right with, with there's big attention and, and uh, a lot of care goes into um, finding the correct set and setting and, and with taking a high dose of a psychedelic but with microdosing that is not there at all in in the literature at least or in studies um, and even like people are advised to do their daily um, things their daily activities 
but um, what this paper says is more <clears throat> that um, psychedelics can put a person into like more suggestible state and very context um, sensitive state. Yeah. And and with large dose studies, of course, that is very obvious. But with low doses, this can be just as much the case. And if you then, you know, you you continue doing your own work and your own daily activities, that can, of course, then influence how you experience these things. And that is interesting, um, I think, because people can realize maybe that what they are doing from on a day to day basis is not really correct or not really working for them or that can lead to maybe to negative outcomes in these people that's just a su suggestion right because this mm -hmm. is not uh, researched but and and a big focus on that of that paper is also that we uh, in the controlled study should um, report more what is the set and setting because we can learn from that and of course in in controlled studies we put people in the lab in a boring lab and let them do boring tasks because we yeah we want to know on these standardized tasks how they are doing but of course this is not really representative of how people are microdosing in real life so um yeah i, I just found that very interesting that it's just not has, has not been the focus uh, in microdosing yeah. but I'm, I'm very curious to hear what you uh, think of of this Mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah I, I, <laughs> uh, yeah yeah like i want to kick this one off um you know we work with um an indigenous uh person uh social she's a mazatec medicine woman um and just as an example that in uh indigenous communities for them you know their cosmovision is that everything is connected and we are connected to everything to you know our ancestors our lineage our, by our genes but also by uh, on on different levels um we're connected to nature you know everything we eat everything we drink um the the cycles of nature uh, we we resonate with all of that we are part of that so um and then in our team we actually found that microdosing is one tool to help you feel more connected to help you realize that you're connected and uh, uh, in the first place to yourself and then to others and to nature etc so yeah and then science is kind of doing the opposite of like trying to isolate it you know always looking to to to, to get a finding of something specific um, whereas yeah if this really is you know this is one vision of course one perspective on microdosing it helps you feel connected then yeah we should start <laughs> measuring that <laughs> somehow um, and then here comes actually my point um, there is one researcher uh, Rosalind Watts uh, she was like quite um, she, she became I think known for her research with psilocybin for depression and she developed the connectedness scale because uh, she said this is something that seems to be the key, one of the key factors in people who overcome their depression or uh, really significantly diminish their depressive symptoms from one time psilocybin. Uh, it's that they feel more connected. And uh, to my knowledge, uh, she developed this skill because there wasn't a way to measure that. So, yeah, maybe this could be a starting point. What do you think? Yeah, <laughs> yeah what I, I want to add is, is that the mindset or the set is is most important so uh, if we guide uh, our clients or uh, we coach people we we tend to um, motivate them to be in a certain mindset that that they can uh, in that mindset they can get the most out of their microdosing experience uh, so the setting becomes a little bit less relevant but um, like i already mentioned that yeah, you, uh, depending on the setting, you can adjust your dosage, your microdosing. Um, but the mindset is most important. And for, for instance, for people with burnout or, or depression, uh, it, it it doesn't it doesn't say like microdosing heals the depression. It all depends on which phase of the process people are at the moment. So if they're already um, eating healthy or doing some exercises or breath work or meditation, then microdosing can really be a, a really good aid uh, because they have the, the right mindset. But we first guide them to that mindset and that that 
uh, phase. So that's what I wanted to add with the set and setting. It becomes more relevant uh, than, yeah. Yeah, you can be, if you if you see it as a spectrum, right? And for instance, depression is maybe a good example. You can be totally on one end, which is like the victim mindset of like, life is not treating me well and you know, why is this all happening to me? And, and this this victim mindset. But then on the other end of the spectrum, you have that uh, person really wants to do something about it and is really ready to transform, to heal, to be better, to do something for the world. And, and I think that... Um, yeah, that whole spectrum in between is where you can find someone who starts microdosing and who starts, you know, uh, signing up for a psychedelic study of therapy. Yeah, you have to figure out where are they. And uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. Mindset is really important. Yeah. 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 So I, I'm actually curious if that is, yeah, you, you, you mentioned set and setting, but maybe even this whole just mindset topic is that being researched at all in general like when we talk about mindfulness or before we continue with the rest of the interview i'd like to inform you on one of the programs we run at microdosing institute that might interest you our six-week microdosing intensive is the most holistic and powerful option we offer for microdosing support 95 percent of participants indicate that they had a positive personal transformation in just six weeks additionally Many participants gained lifelong community connections and valuable tools to continue exploring and integrating insights even after the program has ended. One participant noted, The arc of the program worked well and guided us through our experiences. It was very clear from everyone sharing that we had all been through a profound process together that touched each of us deeply. To start your journey of personal transformation with microdosing, Please visit the link in our show notes or head to our website. Um, <laughs> mindset. Well, more maybe referring back to what you mentioned before, um, that research is really trying to isolate things. Like mindset is a very broad thing and it involves a lot of things like eating habits, exercise, nature. I'm just naming a few. Um, but of course, the... the um, how researchers can draw a conclusion is by isolating these things and to control for as many factors as possible to really say, okay, this thing that we manipulated is causing this effect. So it, I think it's the nature of, of research, but it is Absolutely. like, but it is uh, indeed then um, difficult to to research a thing such as mindset and um, what what you just mentioned. If a person is really ready and um, um, to undergo such an experience and involving all um, the personal factors of this person will just be yeah of less importance in a controlled study and that is also what I mentioned before I, I'm curious to see if in the future there will be a more uh, interesting or complex design taking these things into account but also by the way about uh, depression because you both mentioned that there will be a, a big controlled study in Australia but like many many participants uh, over i think a six week treatment period with microdoses so that will also be very okay. interesting is vince polito uh, yeah. conducting that okay yeah yeah and i think that's the first um controlled study with oh, depression on microdosing yeah so that's uh, yeah, that. yeah that's exciting <laughs> that's exciting yeah okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm so happy to see that this is all moving forward now. Like it, it, it felt like it had like sort of a slow start because we've been doing this for now more than five years. And in the beginning, we could hardly <laughs> mention any science. And now, uh, yeah, there's all these all these things happening. And um, um, sh should we just go back to the ADHD study? Just uh, um, I'd love to hear a bit more about um, the study that you're actually going to set up. And yeah, just talk about it like what are you really hoping to find what are you really hoping to measure um in this controlled setting then um yeah so that will be a, a controlled multi-center trial so it will be partly conducted in basel in switzerland and then partly uh, at our university and um, we will um we have 52 participants in total and then half of them will receive six weeks two times a week placebo and the other half will uh, receive a low dose of LSD. Um, so treatment is twice a week for six weeks. And then um, the main focus of the study is just the safety and the efficacy. 
So uh, continuously we will monitor them, um, the safety measures, uh, um, like vital signs. Um, there will be physical examinations during the study um, and also repeated assessments of their ADHD symptoms. So to see if it is effective and if it's safe. Um, secondary to that, we will focus on, on cognition. Um, so attention, inhibition, time perception, these things. Uh, we will measure them before the treatment period and uh, at the end of the six weeks to see if there is a change there. Um, but then again, I, I, like I mentioned before, this is a controlled study. So people will come to the university and they will, for example, do the attention task in a boring lab. Mm -hmm. And um, that that might be difficult um, to to uh, uh, for these for these patients. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, we haven't started yet, and I'm, I'm very excited to uh, get this started. And um, Kim as well. <laughs> we are yeah, we're trying our best to. Um, start as yeah. soon as possible and uh, but that is the main main focus of the study so safety and efficacy okay um, to to even now is it safe because that is a, a big also a big question in microdosing because you're using repeated doses for a long time and even though uh, many people have been doing it um there's no concrete evidence scientific evidence yet of like what does it do to your blood pressure or your heart or uh, things okay, like that. A period of time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that is what we also will be uh, focusing on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can still remember when Kim Kuipers and I uh, discussed the whole ADHD uh, idea uh, at our the second uh, seminar, when the dosing finding studies was published. Like, hey, a lot of people in our community are microdosing for ADHD. Yes, please write a write a study on that. So finally, it got got pro published. And uh, so it's great to hear uh, you're moving forward with a with a, a, a follow up study, and there's also the the dosage then already like in place. You know what what do you get because there was also a paper came out that like uh, um, weight and and height didn't interfere with the dosage. So so how do, how do you how do you um, yeah, what do, what do you give to the the, the participants? Um, we will be giving uh, twenty micrograms of LSD, which is considered quite a high uh, yeah. micro dose. So we we tend to say low dose as well because it it is yeah. I mean, it's yeah. def what is a micro dose and what is a low dose. What is a like? There's not really clear definition, I guess, on it. Um, but um, yeah, so that will be done in that study. Twenty micrograms. Yeah. Well, the definition of a microdose is that you don't have any visual uh, yeah. distortions. Uh, that is, and so no classic psychedelic effects. That's the thing of a microdose, I think. But people with ADHD tend to take a little bit more than than average, also. So mm. yeah. yeah, yeah, that's something we uh, fail to really um, assess in that in that naturalistic study because it was difficult to. Um, yeah, a lot of people gave in, like it's a free text entry and you can see that some people do make mistakes in what they report. It's like, that is that it just didn't make sense, for example. Or, um, so that is a nice thing about these controlled studies that you know what they will get and you know yeah. what it is exactly. Um, but yeah, it's, so I'm, I'm very curious how that those will, um, uh, yeah, how that those will be tolerated by the participants. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 I think also uh not only the dose but also the protocol um because this is also and again like uh, it sounds almost like w we are ahead of science in terms of finding things out and but we are really just anecdotally comparing uh, microdoses with ADHD with people who uh, don't have ADHD and I, I think we can say that um, the ADHDers they benefit a bit more if they microdose every other day somehow mm. they keep the same flow of being focused feeling good about themselves um, and if they have a larger interval they feel a drop kind of so they kind of fall back yeah. into their uh, old self adhd self i know this sounds really harsh but <laughs> yeah <laughs> so well, that would be an interesting thing as well to um yeah, yeah keep the momentum more yeah. and, and also people with yeah. depression or burnout because the third day uh, the fadiman protocol is a research protocol designed 
uh, on the third day when you have a normal day to look back on the microdosing day to compare the difference and report back to Jim Fadiman uh, in this case. So, so yeah, uh, like four years ago already, we, we started to notice that people on the third day were like anxious or waiting to take the, the other day and mm -hmm. or having having that dip again. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we decided to to advise or work with the every other day protocol. And we f yeah, for some people, it can be helpful to, to work with that. I have a question then, because mm -hmm. if, um, if they have been microdo microdosing for a certain few weeks or something, and then they have a period of not microdosing, right? I mean, is that how people normally then uh, do it in, in your community? And do they not then experience a more like a drop back to like I increase in symptoms, for example, in that rest period. Yeah, so you mean after like a cycle of, of six or eight weeks of microdosing, we always recommend this reset period. Um, um, it's 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 now also, I think experts all agree that, you know, they work on the receptors, um, but those receptors are not meant to be like constantly used by uh, the microdosing substance. Uh, and, and also I, I can even from personal experience say that if you take this break and then you start again one month later, uh, it's, it seems more effective. So there is definitely some sort of tolerance um, that can develop. Um, I don't personally know too much about how ADHDers respond after this, um, you know, when they take their break. Um, the overall um, community, there's definitely people who worry about that. They, they sort of go ahead of themselves and say like, oh, but what's going to happen? You know, the anxiety comes in. What's going to happen if I have to stop? Because I had a really good experience during my first week of microdosing. So, but actually it's, it seems that they, you know, if your well-being increases and you feel more connected to yourself and you feel you have a bit more authority of, over how you feel and how you operate and you uh, may become better aware of your needs, um, and this goes for ADHDers too, that they, they adjust. So they, they, they know better what their needs are. So they also may discover, um, actually what types of tasks they can actually focus better on. Um, or what do they do if I'm not feeling focused or if I'm not feeling good about myself, like, how do I resolve that? Um, so yeah. And then you have a good period there to test that out and to kind of see how you're doing without the microdosis. So yeah, it's part of the experiment and right. it can be a learning experience uh, as well and as for the safety we discussed that with um the researcher it's called kevin on icpr but he mentioned keelan that, uh, keelan yeah, thomas yeah keelan thomas yeah he mentioned that for uh for safety and and reset the receptors uh a minimum of two weeks is uh is advised um but yeah we also tend to say hey let's uh, yeah look back on yet that period what what did you gain for insights and what you did you learn because a successful microdosing process is if you do that you don't need it anymore mm -hmm. but for medical issues like uh, our situations like with adhd it is a, it isn't uh uh a me med medication that that solves the, the adhd it, it turns back again so so yeah uh, we, yeah, but we can in ask parallel, that. there's this learning process going on. Like, I, yeah. maybe it's a bit of wishful thinking that this is going to work for everyone. But we see it in our community that this, these microdosing cycles can be really like used for learning about yourself and your responses and your behaviors, how yeah. and how to cope with it, and uh, and then take what you learned into those periods. Yeah. Um, but I think it also depends on how, uh, where do you rank on the ADHD scale and how much does it bother you in your life and, and all of those things. Yeah. 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 Well, Although we invite you for next week. We have a masterclass from, uh, one of our team members who is a microdosing ADHD coach and she's going to do a masterclass. It will be available oh. online also, but, uh, she's yeah, doing yeah. it live cool. next yeah. weekend. Join us. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Please uh, <laughs> send me uh, a link or an invitation. Yeah. 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 Yeah, um, but okay, so ADHD, we covered, uh, mm -hmm. research coming up, and it's exciting because it's the first study of this kind, right? So, uh, yeah, we have to start somewhere, and uh, yeah, let's bring it on. <laughs> yeah, what, what else are you, like, what else are you excited about when it comes to these low doses and the potential, and that based on what you've seen so far, 
um, what else are you excited about that should be studied or that you're like, we absolutely need to look at this? Um, well, apparently there are also women specifically who microdose for PMS symptoms, which is very interesting. Um, yeah, one of our um, um, bachelor students a while ago set also a study up and uh, we're currently um, trying to um, analyze it and, and publish it uh, at some point as well. Um, but that is very interesting, uh, but also maybe difficult to to test in a lab with like hormonal cycles and everything and, and uh, yeah, different time scales of, of women. And, and can you, uh, do you have any more specifics about what is being measured or what is being looked at when um, w within this group? Because it, it's such a big thing also like hormonal imbalance and mm -hmm. uh, it can mean so many different things. Um, yeah, what we what we did in that study is more looking at PMS symptoms and uh, anxiety and depression and um, ask um, if these women have been microdosing or used full doses or nothing at all and to see how they differed. So that is more like a starting off point. Mapping but it out, yeah. Yeah. But maybe in the future that would be like very interesting to see, like to have a controlled study. Yeah. Um, because it was a, a quite a general study. I, I remember that last year or two years ago, we, we uh, motivated our, our uh, community to participate on that study. But it was uh, for women on mood and cognition, I can remember. So it was kind of general, but you, yeah, it, it could be great to focus really on PMS and uh, because, yeah. We, we get a lot of reports from people, uh, especially uh, in the week before they have their period, they microdose, and so they have l more stable mood in that period. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah and so that, that is, yeah, very interesting. Uh, but also, yeah, people do report it, and but no study has been done yet uh, mm -hmm. on this. Um, and, and I'm also very interested um, on the effects on sleep and yeah. because some people uh, take microdoses um, early in the morning, some t people take it uh, later at night and because it influences their sleep or maybe it, interf it makes them sleepy, I don't know exactly why, um, but I'm very interested to see how it can affect sleep because sleep is very important in well-being in general and... Uh, yeah, so it's the biggest life hacker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I had this discussion with Kim and also with Torsten Passi about this because there was one study uh, with, I believe, uh, low doses of uh, LSD, but they they noticed that the REM sleep uh, uh, takes longer, so you have a longer REM sleep. So his hypothesis or theory was like maybe the microdose doesn't. Uh, um, uh, decreases the, the depression, but maybe because you sleep better, uh, uh, that uh, if you wake up uh, and hey, you slept well, then you have a better day. So it could, yeah, it it would be great to to measure that, yeah, yeah. And and about the, that, people take it uh, during the night or uh, at night. Uh, that's because yeah, some people uh, get f uh, fatigue or. Um, uh, yeah, sleepiness from the truffles, for instance. Mm. It, it mainly uh, is with psilocybin, of course. So then uh, people started to take in it uh, before they go to sleep. The nightcap protocol is that. Mm. So yeah, people have the indirect effects of the of the microdose still. Yeah. 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 Like you just said, it's interesting to see um, um, to en entangle this um, effect of microdosing and depression and indeed if there is a role of sleep in that yeah very like very interesting to me yeah and um, uh, and also the whole topic of sleep right like even something like insomnia it is so hard to uh like you said untangle it uh what what are the causes and why is it so some people feel perfectly fine or they say i've worked through all my issues but this insomnia is still there and um yeah and, and, and also that we can take uh, truffles or mushrooms, psilocybin, in the evening. Um, I do it regularly also. Take it in the evening. I sleep wonderful. I, I wake up more refreshed than I usually wake up. Like, And honestly, it's very... Um, I, I would say it's, it's a paradox for me. Like, I don't understand it at all. But it seems to be working like this for many people. Yeah. yeah. Why is it a paradox for you? Um, 
it could be a paradox because some people report that they actually feel more energy when they microdose. They feel more energized and they ask us also like, really, can I take it? And then how long before I go to sleep should I take it so that I don't, you know, stay awake too much? And yeah, I say, I don't know why that is, but try it out and you'll, you'll see. <laughs> yeah. yeah. High dose of psilocybin have the side effect uh, that, you are, that you are starting to yawn. And yeah. if you take... To yeah. m- if you if you overdose on psilocybin, you you fall asleep actually, or uh, really that's the overdose. <laughs> yeah, that yeah that it's just that you, that you yeah you fall asleep. So it's 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 not a stimulant similar as LSD, where it also binds to the dopamine receptors. I think yeah. that's the main difference. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But it can be a stimulant. Like also recently, I had a coachee who said I take my microdose just before my workout and then I go to the gym and I have a more yeah. uh, I have more energy but also I have a more embodied workout I like I make more the connection with my training and with my movement and with my body so yeah um, th- this uh, maybe this is an interesting concept also for like what what do researchers uh, think about this like we always call it a non-specific amplifier so it can also amplify that what is at that moment alive in you and if that is like wanting to be at the gym and wanting to move it helps you move if it is wanting to sleep because you know you really need your good sleep it helps you sleep and then on an emotional level that's also uh, what we often see yeah i think this really nicely copies like um um goes into this whole paper with set and setting which says that psychedelics make you more uh, context sensitive which is like from external cues, but also internal cues. And if you are going to the gym and you are excited for your workout, I can imagine that that plays a role. Um, So, uh, yeah, internal and external cues are very, um, very important when you take a psychedelics. And also, I think, with microdosing. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the big discovery that definitely also for microdosing. And is this something that could be studied? Like, are you aware of how we could, yeah, take that into account? Um, I think it, it it's already a nice start that the studies that are going on that they report more what they do, like uh, set and setting wise. But you could design a study where you manipulate something in set or setting, like. Um, manipulate something in their expectations or manipulate something in the environment um that would be a cool design i think yeah 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 Yeah. i hope it's ethical also because you could be you know bringing people bad news and then later say sorry it's not true (laughs) yes no yeah it could go terribly (laughs) very important to keep it uh, ethical um yeah Yeah. but of course like a, a boring lab setting or um a more comfortable yeah. setting where they still have to do the same thing but it's still the setting is different or when there are um multiple people around or where they are alone like these things are setting and that could be of influence it may be also how you perform on such an attention task which is yeah very boring or can you take breaks in between like these things yeah 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 absolutely Lots of microdoses also, especially people who are just beginning and who are sharing their experience with others or they are in a group, they also often start sharing music with others. Like, you know, this is my microdosing playlist or so. Yeah, it's, it's definitely makes us sensitive to, uh, to those external cues. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Yeah. What else do we want to talk more about? We have uh, a couple of minutes left. Uh, Mm -hmm. We covered lots of ground already in terms of um, studying uh, all these different factors. Yeah. If, 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 Elina, is there still, mm, if you could really dream up a study without any limitations, if like there was money, you had unlimited participants, everybody's safe and sound and um, what, what, what would be really important? for the world to do? (laughs) That's a very big question. I know, I know. (laughs) Important for the world to do. Yeah. For mankind. (laughs) For mankind. Um, Well... Yeah, I mean, that's why we all do this, like, essentially, right? (laughs) If we... Yeah, Yeah, well, I think... um, I think every researcher is already kind of doing that. Like, it is a little, little, little break. Um, 
but um, together it is of course very important and I think every type of research maybe that's an important thing like I don't see the the only like the placebo controlled studies as the only studies I think the naturalistic studies are very uh, nice complement to these um, controlled studies um, yeah but yeah, no, to, to come up with a... <laughs> oh, no, that's a difficult question. I, I yeah, cannot really answer. Cannot really think of something right now. No. Right. But um, yeah, I would be very interested to, with the sleep thing. Um, yeah. 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 What, I, what I like that you, that you say is that the natural studies, like uh, uh, we always uh, uh, do the citizen science, uh, uh, you know, and uh, we know that, that some uh, researchers have uh, uh, critics uh, or are critical about the, the outcomes of citizen science anecdotal reports um yeah so we are happy that um now like the microdose me app uh, where kim kapers is also involved in and um so yeah that is sort of a citizen science project and mm -hmm. i think that the, the the two can can strengthen each other so um yeah yeah i i remember there's a um yeah, is this a definition? I, I wrote it down here. Um, patient and public involvement, PPI, is defined as research performed with or by patients and members of the public rather than to or for or about them. So it is really this involvement. And I think it's, 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 we're taking some steps now in doing that. Um, um, here in this microdosing community where we are coaching people and yeah, we're very interested in their results. And um, so it is actually citizen science, like just gathering some data where people are actually, they know it, they provide more data. They say, I want to, you know, uh, help the community understand microdosing better. So I'm happy to report what it's doing to me. And then if you can, you know, bring those, that data together and extract some, some findings from that, that's really great. Um, and so, so yeah, we're seeing this happening, but it would be, I think, amazing to see this also on a larger scale. And, and I think maybe the ADHD is, study is a good example of this as well, um, that in the end you can do really good research if you really involve <laughs> these people who have these symptoms and see how they interact with a potential tool for their betterment. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think it's very important. Like we as researchers don't really know what the patient's needs are unless you ask them. Um, so um, with a few other survey studies we, we set up or we are setting up, we, we have this question included at the end. Like, what do you think that we should research? And there's some like interesting oh, yeah. um, uh, comments coming in from that question. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think it's a very important and good point because we we can never, yeah, know uh, unless you ask. Yeah. What, what, yeah. What we never find, assume. Yeah. What we find it interesting to know if uh, because we have these uh, coaching programs uh, uh, is a coaching uh, um, helpful for for some people. So that is the beauty that we we will uh, yeah y your team will be uh, following our our participants on our program um, and, and study if, if microdosing in combination with coaching can be helpful. So um, we didn't cover that, but um, I'm really excited about that for that collaboration also. Yeah, that, that would be very interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it comes it comes down also to one of the thi one of the things that um, uh, James Fadiman also um, I wouldn't say change his mind about, but he started collecting all these reports from people who were microdosing on their own. And of course, there were so many wonderful results, and that's why we're all here now uh, trying to find out more. Uh, and more people started microdosing based off of those findings. Um, but at some point, he, he said, oh, I actually see that there is even more benefit in people who are part of a community who connect to other microdosers or who are connecting with a coach. Um, yeah, then the, the results are more sustainable also. So, yeah, I think this is... Uh, this is going to be really exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It might maybe also be a thing in general in society that people are just less connected in general, leading to negative yeah. effects. So uh, it would be nice to see if, if microdosing is indeed a way yeah. of getting more connected with yeah. these things. Because, yeah, indeed people are more focused on 
maybe phone or other yeah. things that that weren't there years ago yeah which has a big impact i think on yeah. humans if there's one benefit that most people report who have a positive uh, experience with microdosing is that they feel more connected to themselves to the, their surroundings and uh, the people and nature and that's of course what uh, we can all use i think uh, in this uh, yeah. society and uh, yeah yeah Wow, yeah, beautiful ending point for this. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you one more question uh, for, uh, yeah, before we wrap up. Uh, I know that a lot of people are interested these days in like becoming a psychedelics researcher or um, uh, over the last years, this, uh, this has been like a, a field with maybe the, the biggest potential and the biggest excitement levels and um, yeah, from your own experience, what could you recommend to people who would like to be uh, active in this field as a researcher? Or, um, yeah, are there some like stepping stones or uh, uh, tips? <laughs> um, I would advise to um, first think really carefully of what you think is interesting and follow that path. And um, um, get in touch with, with people who are um, investigating this and just make sure to, to know the field and, and know what's going on. Um, also, maybe it's good to realize that being a psychedelic researcher does not just involve uh, pr uh, giving psychedelics to participants. It is like maybe not even 5% of it. It is mainly <laughs> also creating documents, getting studies approved and doing all boring paperwork stuff, a lot of reading, a lot of writing. Maybe people don't know or expect that. Um, I like it, but you, it has to like be part of you that you are interested in doing those things. Um, but um, other than that, yeah, I think like the field is growing and I think there will be more opportunities and positions uh, opening up within the future. So um, I think those uh, those things like prepare and, and know the field is uh, important yeah yeah great points great points and and thank you to you for putting in the legwork of uh yeah getting all the the writing done and the the protocols in place and uh, yeah it is really important right well also thank you for uh i mean we know a lot about what's going on in 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 society uh with, with microdosing because of for example, your community is uh, very informative for us to create research questions and to set up studies. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, it, was, uh, it really uh, motivates uh, us, yeah. this interaction. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was always our mission to build a bridge to the, the researchers because, yeah, bringing people together and uh, taking it to a higher level and better understanding, uh, yeah, really helps. So, yeah, thank you too. All right. Well, we will put all the uh, information about the studies that we mentioned in the show notes and um, where people can find more about your work. Um, and yeah, hopefully soon uh, more uh, research happening uh, inside and with our community as well. Um, yeah. So thank you yeah. for being here today and uh, yeah, wishing you all the best, uh, Eileen. Yeah, yeah. Thank you both. Thank you. And to our dear listeners, I hope you've enjoyed this talk and learned uh, a lot alongside of us. Um, yeah, thank you for exploring microdosing with us. To keep learning more about microdosing, please subscribe to Microdosing Table Talks wherever you listen to podcasts. This is a wonderful, zero-cost way to support our initiatives at Microdosing Institute. And if you'd like to help us teach more people about this powerful practice, please consider leaving a review. Your kind words go a long way.